Okay, we are ready for our second session in the juvenile justice strand. This session is about strengthening and streamlining core one, uh, tier one features, the core features of tier one. Our presenters are Jodana Burdoff, Heather Byram, Mitch Gould from West Virginia. You've heard me brag about West Virginia. Um, I would just remind you that our expectations, the forum expectations are still in place. Take care of yourself, uh, be polite, be kind. And um, um, if you have any, if you get booted out of or lost out of uh, Pathable, just sign back in and go back to the agenda and you'll uh, click on this session and you'll get right back in. If you have any trouble at all, go to the help desk. They are very helpful. Okay, Joe Donna, I will turn it over to you and um, your team. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is, uh, we're very honored to be a part of this. Um, what we're gonna talk about today is um, obviously, in, in your, that's what the slide goes over, overcoming challenges of tier one um, in the juvenile justice and alternative learning center uh, settings. Um, and we find the challenges that we came up with, um, the leadership teams, that in itself, the teams can be a real challenge. Um, I came, my background, I did school-wide, I've done individual, I've done classroom-wide, I've done early childhood before I ever came to um facility wide and um the leadership team concept is completely different from all of those um then staff turnover i mean that's got to be um you know it's just in, in cra crazy what um staff staff turnover has always been a problem but it seems to have been it's even bigger now um and um so try to just a, a, attack that a little bit then the transient population um, you know, some of our facilities, these kids are only here two to three weeks. Um, and some of our facilities, it's four to five weeks, you know, so, so we have to keep track of that. And then the last part of it, um, Mitch Gould's going to go over the use of scanners for tracking and tra the data for acknowledgments and all kinds of things and the advantages and disadvantages. This is exciting. We um, started piloting this about two years ago, and it's really been um, an exciting um uh, initiative to watch and I'm hopefully this information will be uh, interesting to you all too. So I'm going to tell you that I get a little lag here on changing the slide. There we go. So the leadership team, um, overcoming challenges with the leadership team. So like I was talking, unlike school-wide PBS, the facility-wide team, it, uh, it can be really large. Um, and um, if you were in the last session, we actually talked a lot about it is so vitally important that you have representation from every part of the facility. Well, when, you know, again, coming from old school of education, then, you know, typically you could have a large high school that would have six members on its team. And you didn't really need much more than that. You had each pro programming, programmatic level or each discipline or something like that. But now we have everything from the maintenance department to the nursing, to uh, treatment staff, to the correctional staff, the educational staff, um, all of that. And um, so if you don't get representation from everybody, you really miss out vital parts, vital information that um, uh, it's interesting because you never know that you don't have it until you don't have it. And then you're like talking and you're doing something and someone will say, well, wait a minute. The nurse has an issue with hallway three because everybody stopped by and wants to talk immediately. And so those guidelines and expectations don't work for her or something like that. And then I will tell you this, if you want somebody to have, and we talk about buy-in, if you want them to have buy-in, they've got to have some part of a um, input and the only way that we can get input is to have them apart. Now, that doesn't mean everybody. It just means somebody as a representation from their team. And then um, the scheduling in a 24-hour facility can be really, really difficult. Because, um, you know, we want, run into this all the time. How do I get a representative for midnight shift? Unless I come in and meet at midnight or the midnight shift comes in on their time off 
or those kind of things, which again, we've done everything. Um, I will tell you, well, I'll get into this a little bit later. Um, securing representation, lots of moving parts and deciding on naysayers. Um, you know, sometimes there's always this question when we're talking and we're talking to the, the, um, the director or the superintendent or whatever, and we say, well, we would like to have leaders, people who influence other staff members. But then some of them say, well, what about, you know, what if we could make this one guy who's really going to give us a hard time, take him a part of the team? Because maybe if he's a part of the team and he's right at the beginning, he'll really buy into this. I can tell you I've seen it work and I've seen it not work. And so I wish that there was some kind of say, you all know you shouldn't. If they're naysayers, don't make them a part of it. Or if they're naysayers, make them. I can't, but I will tell you that um, sometimes I try it. And again, that naysayer has turned around and been my biggest champion. Then I've also had the situation where I've had that nice area and he drags the team down so much that you just want to poke your eyes out before you go meet every time. I mean, it's just, it's just insane. So I think that's something that you have to entertain, but um, you have to really monitor. And then communication, how to get the word out, who should get the word out. Those are all, again, some challenges. And, and we're going to talk about that a little bit here. Okay, so scheduling. Um, one of the things that our team does is we try to schedule all our meetings one year in advance. Um, and um, this is a, there's a couple reasons for this. One is the fact that if it's already planned, because I will tell you that trying to get them, you know, okay, when are we going to do it next month? Um, you know, so you're sitting here and you go to the November meeting and at the end of the meeting you say, okay, well, what, when can we meet next month? And you've got such a large team and you've got all this stuff going on. Um, so we try to figure out if their are days better than other days, if Wednesdays are better than Thursdays or Tuesdays or whatever. And then what times are eight o'clock in the morning or three o'clock, whatever, just to try and then get those dates a year in advance um, for your leadership team meetings. It kind of makes almost people schedule around them instead of trying to schedule PBIS around what they have. So it's already set. So, you know, um, someone says, well, we're going to have, uh, you know, some kind of uh, um, on-site review. And we do it. And then someone will say, well, wait a minute, we've got a PBIS meeting on that day. So it's very helpful for us to do that. It helps with the scheduling, um, especially if you're a coach or somebody that's in more than one facility having that done. And for us in West Virginia, you have to remember, we're very rural. I'm going to say that easily, rural. And um, so we have travel. It's a, it's a good bit of travel for us. So um, for instance, like, you know, when I want to go to the uh, southern part of the state, I really try to stay down in the southern part of the state for three or four days, as, as opposed to coming back and forth, back and forth. Now, that got to be a little different during this past year with the pandemic because we had to go to basically teams meetings. We couldn't meet virtually, leadership team meetings virtually, um, which I will tell you, um, I think there was a time once we, we got into this in maybe July that we were like thinking, well, this could really cut down on travel. Maybe we should really work on doing more of these meetings virtually. I can't speak for everybody, but I can tell you that um, um, nothing really replaces that face-to-face -face intervention, inter, in, 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 you know, um, contact. And you, typically you have a, a communication issue, you have technical, technical difficulties, people can't hear you. Um, and I'll be honest, if you're leading a team, you need to be able to see everybody's body language so that maybe that one person that's sitting over there on the side that's kind of giving you the stink eye, you can go and talk to them later. You put it in your head. Oh, I got, or sometimes I will even address certain parts of the meeting towards that particular person. Um, you see people nodding or disagreeing with you. You need to see that. And you can't do that virtually as much. Now, um, I think as a necessity, we have to. And I think that we're probably going to be forced to do some um, virtual, but um, it wouldn't be my, my uh, first go-to. But again, getting them scheduled a year in advance. Flexibility. Um, my guys can tell you that what I say to them is they're to walk into the facilities and tell them that we work around their schedule. So we can't have a nine to five day. 
Um, and I will honestly tell you, that goes a long way when you're talking to some of these people that work eight, not 10 hour shifts, some of these people that come and work midnight shifts, because, you know, they look at us and we've got these, you know, nine to five jobs Monday through Friday. And it kind of causes, sometimes they'll have some animosity, but when you can look at them and say, if I got to work on Saturday, come in on Saturday when that's the best time to come in, or I have to come in at six o'clock. Um, I can give you a prime example, and Heather's going to speak next, but um, Heather has an, an mentor meeting at a school tomorrow, and I think the meeting starts like at eight in the morning, and Heather's four hours away. And, you know, before, I can remember used to be able to say, well, it's about a three-hour drive, so can we start that meeting about 10, 11 o'clock or whatever? No, we don't do that anymore. They, they set the schedule, and they tell us. Now, we try to uh, compensate for that in other ways, but my staff and, and, and myself, we, we pretty much let the facilities tell us, especially in the 24-hour settings. Um, it's just respectful in a lot of ways. And it also goes for a long way in, in relationship building. Um, entertain different platforms. And like I said, in-person conference calls, team Zoom. Um, and, uh, you know, we were going to have to look at that. Sometimes I may have to say to somebody, well, we can't really meet or I can't get so-and-so. Can we conference them in? Now, I will tell you um, that we do not, um, in West Virginia, we kind of um, stay by the steadfast rule that when we're having a leadership team meeting, that the superintendent or the, you know, whatever their title is, and the principal have to be there. If they can't be there, we don't meet. And um, if you were in the last, um, if you looked at the last session, um, the principal, Andy talks about, they're the stakeholders. Um, that's an old kind of thing I learned years and years ago back in special ed, because when we would make decisions and then we then we take it to the special ed director, they would say, well, we can't do that after we've just spent three hours meeting about it. So you wanna have those stakeholders there and, and, and be able to tell you that, but so whatever platform you have to have. Now, if you get into a situation um, where there's, you know, you can never have the afternoon shift uh, person there because of the time we're having it. You need to reevaluate that and say, okay, this person can't be here. What's going on? And how do we communicate with them what has happened? And do we need to change some things? Um, you know, um, we have some facilities that Tuesdays are always good. So it's the second Tuesday of the month that we go. But there's others that we say, no, in order to get the representation from here, we're going to be on Monday in January, but in February, it's going to have to be a Thursday. And Monday could have been an a.m., but Thursday's going to have to be an afternoon. And you just, that flexibility, I can't really stress that enough, that as the coaches for leadership teams, you have to be very, very flexible. And then just having, and, and that means as far as time, but it also means in platforms also. Um, this other thing, always have an agenda and send it out a week in advance. Um, I think that if you, first of all, we learned a long time ago, if you don't have an agenda, um, then a lot of times your leadership team meetings can turn into, um, um, uh, I'm trying to come up with the appropriate word. I know what I want to use. I'm trying to come up with the appropriate word to use, but it just becomes into where a nag session where people just complain. And next thing you know, you're off the rails talking about something that has nothing to do with it, that John, you know, the afternoon shift is not making the kids do blah, 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 blah. And then they get into this whole thing, or should the staff bathroom be allowed, allowing kids to come into the staff bathroom, you know, all of this. Agendas keep you on track. It also shows respect for the facility and the educators and all the people there, the respect for their time. And I always say, they're giving me their time and we're doing this for PBIS, but it's an hour, hour and a half that they don't have that's just laying around that they didn't have other things to do. So the agenda shows what we're doing and when we're doing and it keeps you moving. And I send that out on a week in advance, simply, um, and I, I mean, our staff does the same thing. Sometimes it might be three or four days, but it, it never less than four or five days. Because um, if there are, um, and if you're doing this right, um, many of the team members will have um, assignments, so to speak. 
they will have things that they need to report out on. And to be quite honest with you, um, we would be foolish to think that there aren't times when there are team meetings and the people are there and they don't actually think about too much about PBIS until the next team meeting. And then all of a sudden they come in and they're not prepared. So this gives them that chance to be, you know, oh, oh, that's right. I was supposed to look for the prices of t-shirts because we were going to order them with our, um, um, our acknowledgements on it. And I haven't contacted that person yet. I need to get on that, those kind of things. Um, and I think that um, it also makes you as the coach kind of check yourself and say, are you facilitating and giving roles to the team instead of trying to do it all yourself or taking all the control yourself. Um, that was a hard one for me. Um, and and um, so, I, but I also found that the more you give it to them, the more ownership that they have, then of course the better off you are. And I think it also makes you try to make sure that they're, and Brenda mentioned this in the last session, if there's just one person that's buying in and keeping it up, if that one person leaves, the whole system can fall apart. So the agendas and your assignments of the agendas kind of help you see if you're, is there just one person doing it all or that kind of thing and trying to spread the wealth, so to speak, of, of, of that. Um, so like I said, it kind of keeps them, all the staff on their responsibility. I also think <clears throat> the agendas um, sometimes are very, um, a, a reflective tool for me so that when I'm getting ready for the next meeting, <clears throat> I can look back and um, I can see that uh, this is what we went over. But then sometimes I'll look a year back just to see, are we still drilling on the same thing? Are we still really just hassling about the same thing? Are we moving forward at all? And every once in a while, I'll take that agenda from a year ago and bring it to the meeting and say, guys, look at what we were covering in November of 2020. Look how far we've came because sometimes that day to day stuff, they can't see it. And maybe the um, improvements and the things that you've done are in such small increments that they, the team itself cannot see how far they've come. So you have those agendas. Also, I will tell you that from a, from a um, systems position, agendas are good because if somebody ever calls and says, what are you doing? Why did you go out there? What do you, you have some kind of accountability? Also tell you that, and I don't have this on the slide, but um, I tell my staff, if you don't have a sign-in sheet, it, the meeting didn't happen. That's for accountability from, from our part, but it also, the sign-in sheet has all of the, has the, the, their names, their titles, their emails. Because I'm gonna tell you, if you get four or five teams that you're in charge of, and they're large teams, you're gonna forget who was the head of the treatment staff at such and such place, and who was the head of security staff at such and such place. And these sign-in sheets can make you look back at it. Every once in a while, you may need to just email one person. You can just pull that up and go right to it. And again, it has some accountability. Um, um, we had to pay overtime because they had to attend this meeting. Um, so those kind of things. But um, this is all just to try to keep you. Oh, I just get a message right now that says my internet connection is unstable. I hope it stays. Oh gosh. Okay. So the next thing is securing proper representation. The workflow chart, which um, I believe is in the handouts. And the workflow chart is basically um, something that um, Andy and Mitch developed together. You're gonna hear from Mitch and later, and Andy was in the last, um, and it just talks about trying to figure, because I will tell you coming from the education part of it, I didn't know what a direct care staff supervisor, a blah, 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 or treatment staff, what they did or what that meant. And this helped us. So this, direct, this workflow chart was really, really helpful to us. The other thing, spending time observing all parts of the facility, Obviously you have to get permission for this, um, but I will tell you when you're sitting in a meeting and they're talking about the pods or they're talking about hallway three or they're making reference to the showers, 
you need to have a visual representation if you're going to lead that team on what you're doing. So we ask, we say that all the time that you need to um, um, observe uh, and go in, do a walkthrough, sit down, have lunch, do whatever you have to do to kind of see how lunch moves, how does transition move. Um, when I've seen them, you know, transport certain people on vans and how that goes, and we were doing guidelines for the van, I had to kind of see that. Um, and so then, and that helps when you're securing proper representation because those people see you there. Um, and then the networking, like I said, um, and we talk about this a lot in West Virginia. Um, it's a lot about relationships. Um, if you, Cause you have to remember for most of us, if we're going and we're coaching and we're trying to get people to do this, it's not something a lot of them wanna do. And so how do you get people to do something that they don't want to do and have the buy-in? Some of it is based on your relationship with them. Um, you know, um, and like I said, you'll hear from Mitch here in a little bit, but um, and he's not going to be talking about um, relationships, but he talks about how at one point in time he was going to a particular um, BJS site and a lot of the guys there were hunters and the security officers. So he just threw in the back of his truck his dog kennel things that because he hunts with dogs he threw them in the back so when he pulled up those guys seen that and wanted to talk to him about that now i can't do that because i don't have dogs but i find other common ground find ways to make relax and network with these people and 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 um you build a relationship with your leadership team the way you want your leadership team to build relationships with the students or the clients or the whatever you want to call them you view them that way. You try to build that relationship with them. The second thing as far as overcoming challenges on the leadership team is uh, communication. Again, uh, as I already talked about that, the sign-in sheets. Those sign-in sheets help everybody. It keeps everybody on track. And typically our sign-in sheet, again, would have their signature, their title, and their, and their contact information. And it's just passed around and it just helps us keep track of everything. PBS newsletter. Um, we have several of our facilities that do a PBS newsletter. Um, what we have found, especially between education and the facility, is these newsletters because something, oh, somebody moved this on, okay, um, is that um, our, um, a lot of times our facility would say, wait a minute, we didn't know there wasn't school today, or we didn't know you were doing testing. Or we didn't know they were, and the the um, school would say, wait a minute, we didn't know that so and so was going on a visit for three days, and this communication, and there's so much going on, and so many moving parts. So sometimes just a monthly or weekly newsletter, just to let everybody know what's going on. I will tell you that um, one of our places that where PBS has done very well, their newsletter really talks about all the stuff that happened well with PBIS, what particular dorm achieved so much higher how this and they kind of even shared some of the data or what particular staff person actually won the gas card for um, teaching the the guidelines so much those kind of things those are just ways to communicate and then i also had to find this out ask what the most efficient way because i can tell you this we've found out several times our direct care staff a lot of times or our our people in corrections they don't email or they don't read their emails. They don't care about their emails. They don't look at it. And here we're sending all this stuff and we're like, well, didn't you get the email? And they're like, no, we don't even look at it. And I don't think we can judge them for that. We just have to figure out a better way to communicate with them and and, and, and then acknowledge that and go on. Um, a note taker, uh, that's what a big deal in our leadership team is to always have a note taker. And um, I've had to actually, we have a note taker and then I get the notes and I'll be like, okay, did you remember this? Or every once in a while, uh, while I'm talking or leading, I'll look at the note taker and say, hey, don't forget to put that in there. I need to be reminded to do this, those kind of things. But um, that person needs to be very uh, skilled. And sometimes it's okay if, uh, I remember one time the principal volunteered to be the note taker. Well, then he got so involved in the meetings, he forgot to take the notes. So then he was doing it off memory and he was missing things. And he wasn't for, he wasn't trying to be it. So I finally looked at him and said, buddy, we got to get somebody else to do this. And, and, and he was okay with that. But I also think too, if you were going on a couple, you know, after one year, somebody else needs to take the notes. It shouldn't be left up to the same person all the time. Um, 
And I will tell you, as far as note takers, one of the things that we have to do a lot of times, and I, it's just something, a little little thing I do. I would hope that my note taker gets my notes back to me in the next 24 hours or whatever. But as I tell my staff all the time and what we all have to remember, PBS is our life. It's what we do. It's our whole screen. When we go into these facilities, PBS is a blip on the principal screen, a blip on the, uh, it, it's not what they totally do. They have a thousand other objectives. And if we try to treat them as if this should be the most important thing that they should do, and we don't respect and have and acknowledge that this is one of many things that they have to do, then they'll shut us out pretty quick. So I always tell my team, go in and, 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 and be respectful of their time, but remember that they're meeting with you for an hour and they have six more hours of meetings on se seven other things. So try to be respectful of that. And so the note taker sometimes won't get right back to you. And so I usually give it four or five days. And typically I'll do something like say, well, I'll email and say, hey, did you send me those notes? Because I forgot them. I can't find them. Or, or whatever, just, and they'll usually typically, oh no, here they are, and they get right on it. But we have to remember that those people leave that meeting, we leave that meeting and go back and think about more PBIS. They leave that meeting and go work with kids. They leave that meeting and go work with the lunch and the, the all of that. So you have to really kind of always remember that. So anyway, that's the the, the challenges that we come up with or how we overcome some of the things with the leadership team. Um, so now I think that, um, Heather, do I need to do something? Heather's going to talk to you about, um, uh, the transient populations and a couple other things. All right. So thank you, Jordana. So Jordana was just talking to us kind of about some of the challenges that we face when we're working in these juvenile justice settings and in alternative settings. And, you know, common with that leadership team, another challenge that we overcome a lot and that we see is staff turnover. So we're finding in a lot of these settings, um, whether it be on the school end or on the facility end, we're having constant turnover in the adults that work with these kids. And, you know, Jordana just spoke about how we all need to be on the same page for consistency and we want to get that message out to everybody. And, you know, that's hard when in a lot of our facilities we're seeing staff that maybe don't even make it. Um, a week or a month past their, you know, their orientation training. So, you know, a, some of the problems that we face because of this is finding ways for all of the adults to be consistent. Um, you know, we got to get the time to train them and for them to understand what we want through our PBS programs. Um, we want to be able to make sure that they know enough to model that and to hand out acknowledgments and that they know our expectations and guidelines. And when we're constantly having that turnover, that makes it a challenge to just even get the message out there to the adults that are working with kids. Um, you know, that also speaks on the initial training, but also the ongoing. So you're talking about, you know, how do we pass that beginning orientation? How do we continue providing support for our adults that work with kids? Um, it causes challenges with fidelity, um, not only the specifics of the program at that facility, but just the philosophical view and procedural approaches of the PBS programs. And then also with the amount of training and knowledge that staff have to have when they're working in these juvenile justice centers, it also um, sometimes can become a problem with staff buy-in because we're not as um, aware or focused on that PBS program. So they might not find value in this, as Jordana was just saying, it's just one thing that they do and you know, making it so that it's the center of their program is a little bit difficult to do with the in and out of staff. So some things that we've done um, within our programs to help with these challenges for consistency, we've been able to use um, employee guidebooks and handbooks. And so basically what this is, is um, when they come into a facility, whether they're an employee of the facility side or an employee of the school side, when they get that orientation packet, there is a handbook part that is just specifically on that PBIS program. So it may include um, their expectations, it may include their guideline matrix, it might include you know, procedural stuff, how do we hand out acknowledgements, what's the buy-in um, process for our residents or our students, um, things of that sort. And then also just making sure that full matrix is in the packet. Um, also, we're really big on signage and branding. So having whatever your expectations are, we want those posted everywhere. And we want it to be something that our 
um, kids and our adults can quickly access, look at, and be able to, you know, take that to heart and understand what we're wanting from that. Um, some things that we've done for training is that we have included PBS training in new hire orientations, whether that be um, through somebody who's employed for that facility. So you guys, if you attended the last session, you saw Stephanie Moore and she talked a little bit about how she provides that training for new staff when they come in on the facility side, um, whether it's through one of our coaches um, or whether it's, you know, it. Board of Child Care, where Andy Guthrie was speaking from before, they also kind of have somebody in-house that does that. Um, also, when we do that, we want to make sure that we document that that's been trained. So whenever um, we have to come back to revisit that, a lot of times whenever we're doing new hire trainings, they're getting a whole wealth of information. So whenever we document that, we have the ability to see that, yes, they were informed of this. Yes, they do know what this is. And if they're still struggling or don't quite understand, then we can go back and do some reinforcement trainings with that. Um, one of our facilities, and I'm sure more, but I know of one for sure, they do PBIS modeling across all facility trainings. So they actually came up with guidelines based on their expectations from what would they expect from the adults when they're sitting in that training. Um, it might be a training on safe restraint. It might be a training on trauma-informed care. It doesn't have to be a PBIS training. It might be a training one from HR on their payroll procedures. But whenever they're trained, whoever the person is that's training, they model, they have the expectations up for the adults and they have the guidelines up for the adults and they acknowledge the adults when they do those. They hit on, you know, hey, we didn't get to directly teach you this because this is just a model session, but we're still acknowledging and, you know, then they have some kind of trade off of that acknowledgement. So just that kind of modeling for that new staff right off the bat builds the culture that PBIS is, is who we are. It's what we do here. It's what we want for our kids. Um, we also do hands-on training and shadow shifts with mem members of the leadership team. So this may be that you go in as a coach with a member from the leadership team on the facility side or the school side, and you go in with new staff and you actually model, how do we teach our kids our expectations and guidelines? How do we hand out acknowledgements? What is that very specific contingent praise gonna look like? Um, you know, and that goes back to what Joe Donna was saying about showing them that, you know, we're not that Monday through Friday, nine to five. We want to know, you know, what is it like in your world? We want to see the challenges that you guys are facing. Um, and then just having a formal teaching schedule for booster training. So we know we're going to do it whenever there's a new hire. But just like Janana said, there's so many things that, you know, take these people's time. So PBIS is just one part of that. So when we put a formal training schedule into process, that ensures that we're making sure that we get all of the individuals that work with these kids throughout the year, not just that one initial time and then we kind of move past it. Um, ways that we work on overcoming the challenges of fidelity is we just work on modeling and reinforcement of proper ways to give acknowledgements. So, you know, making sure that you know everybody understands that no matter what form it is whether you do points or you know a, a card or a scan or whatever it is making sure that we're not modeling for everybody you know when we do this we're doing it in the moment we're being very specific um and then you know we want to reinforce when our staff and our adults do do that and stephanie spoke kind of on this um if you attended the last ses session on her video they had almost um an adult pbis program where they were acknowledging when staff were giving acknowledgements and you know kind of featuring those people so providing that reinforcement that hey I see you are doing that just kind of provides that opportunity for other people to want to kind of jump in and do that as well maybe if you have some resistance from them um, it is very important that you have modeling and feedback from the leadership team and so Jonna, Jordana talked about how that needs to be representative of everybody um, from each department, not every single person, but we want to see the full circle there. And when we have that modeling from the leadership team, it shows that they value the PBIS program, but it also gives the point where, you know, direct care staff or maybe the kitchen staff who don't attend those meetings, they have somebody that they can go to and their voice can be heard and they know that's going to come back to the leadership team. So that's very important, you know, and we found in some of our, our facilities, as Jordana said, you don't notice that they're not there until you notice that they're not there. You find this problem, hey, you know, we didn't even know this gap was here. Who do we need to include so that this voice is heard? Um, and then, of course, with Fidelity, there's also um, the Fidelity inventory and the facility-wide Fidelity and the inventories that you can look at on a database perspective. Um, and then with staff buy-in, this one can be very hard 
especially um, for direct care staff, I think when they work with these kids day in and day out, and you know, sometimes just the amount of paperwork and everything they have to do just becomes really overwhelming for them. Um, you know, in our schools too, it is a lot for teachers, but as Jadonna said too before, you know, they kind of already have some training and that mindset of PBIS, whereas some of these direct care workers and facility staff don't necessarily have that background. So to help increase staff buy-in, utilizing the data to show positive trends, and we talked some about, you know, data collection tools that make this, you know, easy to look at, you know, where were we globally speaking and where are we now? Um, you know, with the turnover of kids, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, you might not always be able to look at that individual kid and the progress that they're making over a long period of time because they're going in and out of the program. But we can look at, you know, well, January of 2020, we had 200 referrals and now we're down to 100 a year later. Um, and then once again, that is staff acknowledgement programs. You know, whether we want to admit it as adults or not, we all want to be acknowledged. We want to be recognized for our hard work. And whenever we're able to do that for um, the adults in the programs, that's also going to help with buy-in. Um, as I just said, one of our other um, challenges that we face a lot is a transient population. So in the ju juvenile justice or alternative setting, um, the population can be extremely transient. I've heard of instances in alternative settings where a kid isn't even getting through the quarantine period now because of with COVID, they have to quarantine for so long. They might quarantine, come to one day of the facility school, and then all of a sudden they're moved somewhere else. So this is, um, you know, happening even as often as weekly. Um, some of our facilities, you know, you do see some longer term, but still it's not the same as, you know, a very long term facility stay. So this causes a lot of um, challenges in teaching the expectations and guidelines. You know, we want to make sure that our, our residents or our students know and understand. And we know that teaching doesn't just happen in one instant overnight. It's something that has to be repetitive and ongoing. So it's a challenge when we have this this rollover of kids coming in and out. Um, you know, it has caused some problems with data collection. You know, how do we make the data meaningful whenever we're not necessarily looking at the same group of kids? We might be looking, comparing apples and oranges. Um, student buy-in. So we want to make sure that, you know, the students own the program and that they understand the principle of earning. And so we have to find ways that even though our kids are not necessarily staying with us for longer terms, that this can happen. And then um, collective and staff efficacy, you know, allowing all adults that work with these kids to see that, you know, they are having positive outcomes and that they're impacting student behaviors. Sometimes because they have a kid come in and out and they don't get to see that long term change that can be, you know, a little bit discouraging for people. Some ways that we've worked to overcome this with the teaching expectations and the guidelines, we've had a lot of our facilities and schools make a lot of permanent teaching products, and some of these are really great. We've had um, anything from videos um, showing, you know, the adults model maybe what we don't want to do in that setting, and then the kids come through and they model, you know, well, what, what do we want to do in that setting? And that's always really entertaining for, for the other kids to watch, especially when they're, oh, that's my staff in that video, or that's my teacher in that video. Um, we have a lot of our settings that do passports, and so basically they make up some kind of paper-based or electronic-based form, and the kids have to go to each setting, and they have to be taught that setting, and it has to be indicated that, hey, this, you know, this setting was taught, and I understand because I showed by doing this quiz or by doing this activity or by doing these modeling. Um, we have some facilities that use things like Schoology to make um, a module where the kids are able to go in there and use electronic resources, um, quizzes, things like that to work through kind of at a pace of their own. And then we wanna make sure that we have formalized intake procedures. So just like I was talking about with the staff, we want it to be a part of their handbook, their guidebook, whatever it is. We wanna make sure when a kid comes in right away, they know what that facility's expectations are and that that's part of it. And they know that, you know, hey, this is important and this is here where I can access it. Um, and then one thing we've found really well is if you do have some longer term students, using those students as mentors for modeling. So we hear a lot about some of our facilities, especially if they're doing like a group contingency, then they'll come in and they'll tell the other kids, you know, hey, no, 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 we don't do that here. If you, if, you know, we're, we're going to do this instead so we can earn. Um, and, you know, that helps with a lot of the buy in as well. So the data collection, and if you were in the last session, you kind of heard this talked about in one of the videos. A lot of our facilities have switched to electronic data collection forms or methods, and you know that helps with looking at the things 
um, rather quickly, rather than having to wait till the next leadership meeting, whether it be at the end of the month or the end of the week. Um, it also makes um, it a little more efficient so that everything's kind of separated in there for you. Um, we've also moved to tracking both positive and negative behaviors. So what this does is we're able to look at, and it was also talked about in the um, previous session too, in one of the videos, we're able to look at not only just, you know, what were our discipline problems that we need to target our teaching with, but how can we see, are we heavily only acknowledging it in one of our expectation areas and we know we need to work on focusing on another. Um, with the transient population turnover, analyzing data based on the environment, expectation, and time of day, et cetera, that kind of helps with not focusing so much on, oh, is this individual making progress, but it looks at, you know, okay, every day at 315 in the hallway, we're having a bunch of discipline referrals, what is going on? And then pinpointing and solving that problem, whether it needs to be an environmental change, um, whether it needs to be a routine change or, you know, going back to teaching, but using that data to kind of drive the program um, when we see these universal issues helping, how, happening. Um, student buy-in. So, we want our kids to own the program and to have that happen. If we know they might only stay a short amount of time, we have to have frequent acknowledgements or opportunities to trade in these acknowledgements. So if we say, oh, we're only going to have um, one opportunity for an activity at the end of every month, we might have a kid who doesn't even make it there. So now they're saying, well, I just, you told me this is about earning, but what did I earn? You know, I earned that relationship, but I was missing, you know, that interaction. We want to make sure that we have social interactions tied to tangible rewards. So relationship building and Jordana talked about this a little bit and, and Mitch, um, if you ever get a chance, not today, but Mitch loves circle of courage and that's his go to. So relationship building is kind of one of the key components on that. So when we have these tangible rewards, whether it be a, a ticket store or a school store or a closet or whatever, we want to make sure that we're still working on that relationship building. Um, we need to have a shared language. So we want to make sure that all of our students and our adults understand that they are earning the acknowledgement. We're not taking their points. Um, we're not giving them points either because they're earning them. It's about what they're doing. And sometimes we have to have um, the use of the prorated amounts or the passports for our students enrolled for only a portion of a specified time to earn or buy into these events. So maybe we have that long-term event and that long-term goal um, but little Johnny's only been here for one week out of the month to earn that. So we're going to say, okay, you have a quarter of the amount that you need to get. Where a lot of our facilities will use that passport I previously talked about is the way to earn into that first event. Okay, you weren't here enough to earn, you know, your points, your tokens, whatever it is you're using. But when you complete this passport, you'll have the opportunity to. Um, as far as for staff efficacy, we've used some pre and post climate and culture surveys. So just kind of looking at, you know, how has our environment changed because we are looking at, you know, increasing positive behavior, increasing positive interactions, building relationships. And when you're there that day to day, you don't necessarily always notice that change because it's slowly happening. But when you look back at those, um, you can see the difference, you know, kind of what were we like at this point and how are we feeling now? And those can be done not just by adults, um, you know, those can be done by kids too. And, you know, you want to get representation from, you know, within the facility side and the school side. And then looking at once again at that non-individualized data can help build efficacy because when they see, you know, hey, a month ago we were having all kinds of problems in the cafeteria with kids being um, not as respectful as we want them to. So we targeted respect and we did a lot of teaching on that. We targeted handing out acknowledgments on that. And now we're seeing, you know, an increase in positive behaviors in that area. So those are just some of the few challenges um, that we've faced and some ways that we've worked to kind of not completely overcome some of those, but work on those. And I'm going to hand it over to Mitch and he's going to talk to you guys a little bit about scanners. I'm having a little bit of lag here, Heather. Hold on here, it's freezing. Okay, I gave you control there, oh. Mitch. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Well, late morning if you're out west. Um, got some exciting stuff here for you guys. Um, it's exciting to me. Um, and that is the use of scanners and scanning equipment within your tier one systems. Uh, just to give you an overview, what I'm talking about is using a scanning device with barcodes to track acknowledgements, to, to put it very simply. 
uh, give you a little bit of an overview here. So when we started this venture in our department, um, well, it's coming up on four years now, Joe Donald, that's time flies. And we begin implementing tier one, you know, and you guys that have been a part of PBIS know how much work that is. And, you know, I'm going and I'm observing the process uh, at, at each one of my sites. And I can remember being at one of my secure settings. It's a maximum security uh, juvenile uh, prison, actually. And I'm watching the officers, the correctional officers, you know, they're, they're writing out the tickets and they're doing a great job with the interaction, you know, as a kid uh, executed the guidelines correctly. And I'm watching at my, my secure settings with residential sites that were using tickets, uh, stamp cards, different mechanisms um, to track acknowledgements. And I'm starting to see that we have an issue with efficiency, okay? My background, uh, having worked on the host agency side from the administration level, uh, as frontline staff, I know how valuable time is. And I understand when things aren't efficient, they don't last. You, it really hurts sustainability of any program uh, in that world. So we're having a PBIS meeting and the gentleman, the treatment director at one of our sites, he was kind of the guy that took the bull by the horns and, and he tracked the youth acknowledgements and did the shopping with the kids and, and things of that nature. And he kind of off the cuff made a comment about how many hours he had in counting tickets and, 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 and totaling stamps and the shopping process. And I remember I called, I think I called Joe Don. I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I had seen some of the, the uh, some of our adult sites that use scanners for different things. And I thought, you know, this has got to be a way to do this uh, for PBIS and tier one in our settings. So as I researched, um, and before I say this, I, I want to make a disclaimer. I am not affiliated in any way or paid by um, the company that we use in, in our scanners that I'm about to mention. So just to let that be out there. And I came across a company called Five Star Students. And uh, it allows for the tracking um, of barcode scans. Okay. And currently, right now, we're using, we're, we're doing this at three schools. And we're getting ready to actually add another three because it went so well. There's there's three means of scanning. That is a uh, you can see the little picture there. That's a that's a wireless scanner, very small, fits in your pocket. That's one way of, of scanning barcodes. We also have wired scanners that have a long cord. And then at our minimum security settings, the teachers and staff actually just use their cell phone, which you know, as I'm sure you all know, all, all smartphones can actually dual purpose as a, as a scanner. The, the reason we needed the, the uh, and kind of how we went with five-star students is the ability to purchase the wireless scanners because if you've been in maximum security settings, you obviously cannot have your, your cell phone. Now, the, the barcode per se, uh, has we, we try to have that on person. So the kids, some of our, our maximum security settings, the kids have bar have a wristband. Their bar, the barcodes are on the, on the wristband. Um, at our minimum security sites or residential sites, that's often the barcode is often on um, their fold, their school folder, uh, their name, their name badge, those kind of things. So, very simply put, when a student executes the guideline behavior correctly, and that staff, you know, catches them in the act of of doing the the appropriate behavior, they scan that barcode, and that's that. That interaction is still the same as with the ticket. We tell them, hey, this is why you did, this is why you're getting this and you did that guideline correctly. And that interaction I'm gonna talk about in a minute is still so very important, so very important. Um, but the, the scan is in tracked within the five-star program, which is in the cloud, okay? It's not actually a software program. It's you, you download onto your, your server. That information is stored. We pull we pull data from that. Uh, kids shop through that um, through the PBIS tier one model, and it, it tracks everything for us. So just to get into some of the advantages on the, on the second part of this slide, it really increased our efficiency. It allowed people to be focused on working with kids more than counting tickets, okay, or counting tokens. Okay, it gave us some great data, what staff are contributing, what staff are not contributing, what kids are earning when they're not earning. 
Um, so we got some great data uh, through that program. Um, it streamlined the process. And as I've said before, in, 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 in the world of secure settings, if, if things aren't efficient, they, they will not sustain themselves. So I'm constantly trying to streamline the process to make it more efficient. Um, staff efficacy has increased because I don't have to worry about a correction officer filling that ticket out wrong or forgetting to turn it in or putting his, you know, having that ticket in his, in his, in his pants and then maybe puts it in the washer and washes it. I mean, there's just so many things that could go wrong in that process. Um, not that it doesn't work. I mean, I, I feel like our programs were working uh, with the traditional mechanisms in place. I just felt like there had to be an easier way. And that's kind of how we came to, came to this point. The, the students have really gotten into the, the technology piece of this. Each student has a homepage that they can go to and they can see their, how many scans they've earned. And they actually can shop through that page. It has all these, all the activities, events, consumables that they can purchase through that page. And it makes that tracking of, um, uh, of our materials easier to keep track of. So that, that, that efficiency piece has is, is been really, uh, really huge for our, and I'm, I do have a testimonial and I'm gonna try to speed up here so we have time for that. Generally, when I present on this, I get a lot of questions, which is great. So I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for those, for those questions. Now, there is some disadvantage to scanners, and those of you that have been uh, in, in the PBIS world for a while are probably sitting here thinking of some of these, okay? And this was some of my concerns when, when we started this. I think it's really important before you switch a team or facility or school to scanners that you make sure that the staff know the interaction is the intervention, okay? I say this all the time with my teams. That little interaction piece of, hey, Brenda, great job. I really appreciate that. That, and then specifically saying, I appreciate you being on time, or I appreciate whatever that guideline is, that piece is so important. And with scanners, if you're not careful, if people don't get that, it can become one of those things where it's so easy and so efficient that it's beep, and then I go on, beep. You know, you can do that so easily where the ticket, you had to take that time to write it out. So it, it does take some training. It does take some oversight. Uh, I do feel like we, we manage it fairly well. Um, it does, I think it's offset with the amount of data we get on when staff acknowledge, what staff are not acknowledging. And we figure out, is that a training issue? Is that a motivation issue? So it does give us a lot of data to kind of counteract that. Uh, I'll also tell you that I did run into a lot of bureaucracy issues. Um, Hopefully your agency or your states that you all are in are a little bit easier to deal with. I don't know. Because when we first, you know, I told you, Don, I wanted to do this with, with my sites that were interested. I just thought it would be no big deal. You know, we would just purchase the, the school had the money in their budget. So I just thought, yeah, you know, we'll purchase the, the scanners, the software, and, and we'll get this started. Little did I know the hoops we would have to jump through, through, through legal through our technology people, through our purchasing department. So there was a lot of things that I had to go through um, to get to, to where we could, could implement these. Uh, and again, that may be specific to my department. I don't know. So that's something to consider. Uh, they're also obviously more costly than our traditional mechanisms of stamps or tickets or things of that nature. Um, if you're using the smartphones, that helps a bunch because the, the, the wireless scanners is kind of where the cost is. Okay. Those wireless scanners are, are very pricey, particularly since COVID kind of has, has increased the cost of a lot of technology items. So that's something else to, to consider. Maintaining the equipment was something I, I'm, I was really big on having a plan with my teams before we started using the scanners, you know, what are we going to do to care for these items? Right? So have a plan on who, what, where, when, and how, you're going to maintain the equipment. Um, that's very important. They're costly, as I said. So, you know, you want to take good care of them. Um, and I just guess the biggest disadvantage would be that they're just not as tangible. And I, and I mentioned that a minute ago. And I just can't say it enough. The interaction is the intervention. I mean, that that's where we see kids get an increased sense of belonging. 
which leads to some confidence. And I could go a long ways on a soapbox about that. But make sure your teams really understand that and they're very proficient at acknowledging the right way if you would choose to go into using scanners. Um, that's kind of how we did it. And I, and I think it's worked very well, so. This uh, testimonial, guys, is with uh, and what he introduced. I, I think we cut out, might have cut out the piece that he introduced himself. So I'll just tell you real quickly. Uh, this is Mr. Patton. Uh, Mr. Patton is one of our directors at our one of our maximum security prisons for juveniles, uh, where, in which we've been using scanners now for a while. And I'll just let him give you the the testimony on how things are going. At uh, this is uh, called Sam Purdue Juvenile Center. Well, I'm going to try to. Mitch, we don't hear your video, your audio. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, when you start the video um, or the PowerPoint, click share screen or share audio, computer audio. So there's a couple of buttons. I don't have any kind of option for that. Mm, okay. You can take control of it if you know where it's at. Um, Mitch, I might have to do it on my end because I shared my screen. Okay, so let me see here if I can if I can get it. Yeah, I'd love for everybody to get to hear this. If we can hey, Mitch, while well, while she's doing that, um, we've had a couple of questions about cost. Can you? Oh, give sure, us sure, a, sure. Like a general idea about that. Uh, yeah. So again, we, we're we're going through five star students. There is other lots of other options out there. Um, the the program itself, which again is in the cloud is you know one time fee i want to say around a thousand bucks okay and then there's a yearly renewal of a few hundred dollars per site okay uh the scanners is where the cost comes in wired scanners are fairly cheap 40 bucks the wireless scanners however can be over 300 dollars a piece so if you have a correctional center with you know 30 40 officers it can get pretty pricey pretty quick We've actually mitigated that some with um, with having them per shift. So at Sam Purdue, where we have 60 officers, we just couldn't afford to buy that many scanners. So we have like four or five per shift, uh, which which kind of makes it a little tougher to get the data that we want from the, the officer data that is. But uh, at some of our school based, uh, one of my school based programs, school wide PBIS programs, they just use the wire scanners or their or their cell phones. So it's fairly, it's very affordable, you know, doing it that way. Thank you. If you'll uh -huh. let me know if you guys can hear this now. Um, the the, the next thing I want to talk about is the use of, of scanners and scanning equipment um, at Sam Purdue. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit, Gary, on when we first started running the system, talk a little bit about the tickets and, and kind of just how we run the the program, the PBIS program, Sam Purdue. Sure. And then if you could speak to the changes that have been made through while we went to scanners. So okay. To uh, yeah, I'll try. Um, it, it, it took some planning and, and some, 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 some teamwork from the committee and to figure out what would be the best, the best way to, to make this, this occur in tracking data and, um, you know, acknowledging the residents for their positive behavior, um, both on the guidelines and off the guidelines, such as during our randoms. Um, what we had incorporated in the beginning was more like a, a, a wristband, a type of wristband that you may be issued at, at the hospital. But <clears throat> with that, um, we allowed the, the security staff or all staff really to utilize um, a hole punch. And of course it had this little unique design, but every time the, the kid would, it would be acknowledged, 
uh, the resident will be acknowledged for the the appropriate behavior of following through completely with the the guideline or the matrix that was in place at the time the staff would initiate a, a hole punch in the wristband and for individuals individualization um doing what we termed as our randoms the staff person would would um it was like a little ticket um they would write out um what the resident was being acknowledged for their behavior the appropriate behavior and and so on and so forth and which was somewhat tedious and in doing that we kind of fell short sometimes with getting the randoms out and because the staff at times felt that um it was um time consuming in writing out all those um little tickets and but it was acknowledging the resident because the resident was able to have hands-on <clears throat> so we went and and not too long ago um, through five-star program with the scanning devices which the staff absolutely love and and it's um and our only downfall really with that is um it takes multiple scanners in order mm -hmm. um, to, you know, serve the entire shift, including the security, the treatment staff, the teachers, um, so that they would have them on them at the time that the resident needs to be acknowledged for whether it was through a matrix or one of the guidelines or through a random. Um, in doing that, the system provides a barcode um, for what is um, rather it's for respect, compliance, um, through the keys, uh, what we term as keys for success, um, or for, um, a, a, a random, um, and let, let me just elaborate real quick, Gary, for our audience, if that's all right. Uh, when Gary's talking about randoms, uh, just in the PBIS lingo, um, at Sam Purdue, they acknowledge the kids on the guidelines as they go through each activity, of course. But at any point during an officer's shift, they could uh, randomly acknowledge a kid for those guidelines at any point, almost as a catch them in the act way of acknowledging kids for, for, for uh, executing the guideline behavior. Um, I just wanted to clarify real quick, Gary, for those watching. No, that's fine. That they, that they knew what we were talking about. Sometimes we get in our own language and I think, people don't you know and you're right we do <laughs> uh, random is uh is normal talk here <laughs> yeah so but we've so, found that in acknowledging the scanning system that um with the scanners that the data tracking the management of information um it makes the entire process a lot easier and efficient mm -hmm. for staff and of course, the only downfall with, with the scanning system is that it doesn't allow us to track the staff person or, or who is actually initiating the scan. Um, and of course, it would require multiple scanners to, to, um, to serve its purpose, but it's awesome. We, we like it so much better than the hole punch system or the uh, and the the written um the tickets tickets yes sir okay fantastic okay thank you very much heather for figuring that out so just just to kind of recap here guys um that that, that facility there by the way at sam purdue is just just a really awesome success story uh, maximum security when i first went down there they were very very hesitant about pbis and um i'm just really proud of their success and and you can hear in the in mr Patton's voice there you know they're they're proud of what they've accomplished there with pbis so uh just to recap if you want to advance that slide heather i think you have it um just to recap real quick before we get into that uh, you know scanners I think they're great in a certain context, it takes preparation. Again, make sure your people are ready for that leap. Uh, you don't want, it's not something I maybe would start out with, 
Uh, I think it's important they understand. It's a lot of training. Inter the interaction is the intervention. I know I've said that five times, but I just can't say enough how important that is. So thank you very much. And if you guys have any more questions about the scanners or the or how we're using them, you know, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Jodana. Um, I don't see any additional questions in the chat. So I'd just like to call out a, a, a few big ideas from what you said. Um, you know, Jodana talked a lot about the, the strategies that she talked about are really, um, the message there is attention to detail. It's one thing to have a meeting and put it on the calendar. It's another thing to ensure that you're getting those sign-ins. It's another thing to schedule those meetings a year in advance. That's a great idea. It's another thing to you know, be sure that you've assigned a note taker and that you share that role. So that attention to detail makes the difference between having tier one sort of in place and having tier one efficiently and effectively in place. Um, Heather talked about, about use, building PBIS into everything that you do. So all meetings have aspects of PBIS in terms of expectations and maybe acknowledgements during the meeting and um, that in, intentionality and and purposefulness of, of making sure that everyone practices all aspects of PBIS is very important. It's not just an add-on that we do for the youth in our programs. It is how we do business every day in all that we do. Um, I could talk a lot about about building that PBI, those PBIS systems for staff, but that's a very important component of, of your tier one systems. Um, oh, by the way, there's a, a, um, a question in the chat about how long are the meetings and are they weekly? Um, does somebody want to, I, I would imagine that varies from program to program, Jodana? Um, yeah, I just want to say um, it's a couple of things. We've we've kind of went back on this, um, especially you know if if we're uh, bringing everybody together, traveling three hours for an hour meeting, and then driving back, that kind of thing, or bringing on. So we try to go around an hour and a half if we can get two hours, we can. But an hour and a half is about average. Anything less than that, forty five minutes, it does it. You can't get things done too much. We go about once a month. Now we encourage our teams to have sub meetings without us, without the coaches being there, for them to work out certain things. So maybe um, some of the treatment staff will get together and figure out how they're going to work on the passport, or somebody else will get together and work on how they're going to do the data or that kind of stuff. So they can have subcommittees upon themselves that are not actual team leadership team meetings, but subcommittees. But we usually say, about an hour and a half, that's about, you can't, you know, they can't squeeze out more time than that. And again, I think a, a, an hour, 45 minutes is a little short, but that seems to be your sweet spot right there. Excellent. And it may be that you meet more often, especially when you're in the initial planning stages and early implementation. And then once everything's up and running, maybe you uh, maybe you meet weekly at first or biweekly, and then move to monthly. So the the meeting uh, frequency might vary on depending on where you are in the implementation process. Hey Brenda, uh huh. I just wanted to add real quick, and in, in the early stages, you know, it's so jam packed with with information as you're working through things. I like to set up the first thirty minutes as almost like a training on the, the part of the process we're actually in. So if we're developing expectations, I might have a 30 minute training I put together for the team. And then that next hour and a half will be uh, the actual the actual leadership meeting. And then eventually once the program is up and running, you know, you won't have as many trainings, but um, if you can get two hours out of them, that, thir that first 30 minutes, if you can kind of provide that training to them, I think that works a lot better than just trying to train them on the whole process at one time. Yeah. Uh, just something people might want to think about. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, too, it also depends, like, I, I have the one site 
where they were um, in risk of being shut down and not being allowed to take. And so they had to get something up and moving quickly. So they wanted to meet quite often and try to get it done. But then I also tell you, you can't, you can't rush this process too much because it is a philosophical approach. It's a culture. So you've got to breed this. So you can't rush it. And I'm going to tell you, there's teams that we've had, I personally had, that we were a year and we were just getting guidelines and expectations done for each setting because that's so there were so many settings and getting people to agree on it and rehash it and hash it. But you had to let them wade through that mud in order for them to make it their own. Yeah, good point. Um, Mitch, I wanted to call out something that you said, and I think I, I suspect this is going to become a saying among all of us in this session that the interaction is the intervention. That's a- Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> that's really, really good. It's a nice, simple um, way of reminding people that how we interact with youth is really the core of everything that we're doing, so. I think sometimes we get caught up in the minutia of, of analyzing the behavior and putting plans together and staff, you know, a lot of uh, staff will get caught up in, oh, it's, it's the, it's the cookie, you know, it's the carrot and they really miss out that interaction is that's what changes kids lives. And that's the difference maker. I think sometimes staff are almost, uh, they're almost tricked into, into doing it, you know, but uh, the fact they're doing it is what matters. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I don't see any other questions in the um, in the chat. I would, um, I, I think you guys have your emails in the handout. Is that right? I think so. I'm pretty sure. Okay. And if if not, if anyone has any questions for you, they can always contact me. Um, Brenda at techstate, T-X-S-T-A-T-E dot E-D-U, and I will relay the message. Um, Jodana, Heather, and Mitch, thank you so much, not only for sharing your expertise in person, but for all the work that you did on the videos that we watched in the first session and that you shared in this session. Um, I just love hearing from so many people out there who are doing the hard day-to-day -day work, um, they are the true experts. And I learn something every time I watch those videos. So thank you very much to all of you and um, to our participants. We will close out this session. I think there's a little break before the next session. I will see you then. And I hope that you can join us in the facilitated discussion at the end of the day. So thank you everyone. And we will see you in the next session. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks. Thank you.